lovely to be with you, and we trust uh, this morning that we'll know God's presence and help, and that he'll have a word for your heart today uh, in this service. We're going to turn together, please, in our Bibles to the Psalm 42, and we're going to use a few verses in Psalm 42 to introduce a subject that I would like to speak to you on this morning, and a subject that's very relevant uh, for today, for all of us. Psalm 42, and we're going to commence to read, please, from the verse 1. Psalm 42 and verse 1, and while you're looking that up, uh, we thank, we know there are a number of you pray regularly for us, and we want to uh, thank you for that. Now, I don't do an awful lot of preaching at the moment. Uh, I used to preach actually more when I was younger Uh, than what I do. I think maybe it's like the man said, sometimes I get two services, two meetings in the one meeting, the first and the last, and I'm not sure why that happens. Maybe it's because um, I say the wrong things. I don't know. But nevertheless, our times are in the Lord's hand, and you know, God has seasons in our lives, and uh, my life at the moment is spent a lot dealing with individual people. My home seems to be just a constant flow of people coming and going, and I never advertise, I never say anything, but I always pray, Lord, if you have people that have need, that need help, Lord, you bring them. Uh, and, and I also pray, Lord, if they shouldn't come, don't let them come. So I do both things, and there's just a steady stream of people with various needs, and It's a very wonderful and a very uh, privileged position to minister into the lives of people that have deep areas of brokenness and also to see God healing them and to see God delivering them and to see their lives completely transformed. And when I think of some people who were so broken um, uh, years ago and today, I see them in prayer meetings and they're really, truly... Uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, and so in touch with God. It's just such a wonderful thing to see that happening. So God uh, leads his children, and um, you have to uh, recognize that the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect, and God has a plan for our lives. And it's not what we would like to do that matters. It's whether we're doing what God has ordained for us to do. That's what's important. Doing what God has ordained uh, when he saved you, the purpose that he has for your life here on earth, and fulfilling that. And then when life comes to an end, that the Lord would say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So we're going to read now. um, uh, Again, just continue, please, to pray for us, that the Lord will help us and... uh, Of course, I know we all need to pray for one another, for we're in a battle and we're in a hostile environment. Uh, This world is not conducive to Christ, to the gospel, to the Holy Spirit, or the things of God. But we're grateful to God for all that he has done uh, in all our lives. We're going to read then from uh, chapter, or Psalm 42 and verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I have gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I will yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore will I remember thee. From the land of Jordan and of the Hermitites, from the hill Mizar, deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and all thy billows are gone over me. Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his word. Let's unite in prayer again. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together around the Word of God. And we thank you, Lord, for your amazing love and grace toward us in that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And I pray today, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would come in power. And I pray that you would bless your word. I ask, Lord, that you would open hearts, that you would minister to lives. I recognize my own utter helplessness. And so afresh I give all I have and am to you. Please cleanse me, Lord, sanctify me, and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, put a hedge around us. Let your presence descend in power in amongst us. Come, blessed Holy Spirit, come and speak. Come and work in lives, and we'll give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In the 1600s, a man in a prison <clears throat> had a multiplicity of dreams. His name was John Bunyan. He became famous for that book that was renowned and in many homes, and still to this day is in many homes, called Pilgrim's Progress. An amazing book of the life of Pilgrim, who was leading, leaving the city of destruction and on his journey to the celestial city. And as he traveled, he had this heavy burden attached to his back. This burden got bigger and bigger as he traveled, and of course, it was none other than his sin and the condemnation and guilt of sin. But on his journey, he came to a place called Slough of Despond, or the Swamp of Discouragement. And he tumbled into the swamp, and he almost drowned with the weight of his sin on his back. And in his despair and drowning, he cried out for help. And God sent help in the form of a person. And help came and pulled him up out of the slough of despond and threw water on him and washed him. And he said, how did this all happen? And he said, well, on the journey to the celestial city, there are sloughs of despond, there are swamps of discouragement, and you have fallen into one. He said, the mud is so dirty. Oh, he said, that's not mud. He said, that's fear. That's unbelief. That's discouragement but they have all attached to you and pulled you down. He said, I'm so glad that you have come. Well, he said, every time in that place when you shout for help, I will always come because God always sends help when you call for him. The Bible tells us that we know not how to pray, but the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. And then help said to him, you know, this journey to the celestial city, the place where streets are gold, the place of immeasurable joy and peace. He said, there are many, many, many uh, battles you must face before you get to the city. He said, if you're half-hearted, you won't get there. He said, if you're inclined to turn back because it's hard, he said, you'll not make it. And Pilgrim stood up and said, I am resolved to go. No matter what it takes, I am going to go to the celestial city. And help said to him, you will certainly go because you are resolved in your heart to follow the Lord. I want to speak to you this morning on the slough of despondency, but I'd rather just call it discouragement. Discouragement. You see, as we start this journey as a Christian, there are many, many temptations, allurements, and trials that will come on the journey. And our life as a Christian is very much like the seasons. We have times of summer and then times of winter. There are these 
variety of experiences that come on the journey. But we must remember on that journey that the Lord is with us and that the Holy Spirit indwells us and he is there to help us. And so what I want to speak this morning on is what causes discouragement and how we can practically come out of it. Now today, I'm sure many parents here are aware, in fact, not only parents themselves, but dealing with their children, that we have an epidemic of mental health issues. We have an epidemic of people on tranquilizers, tablets, medication, people trying to get assistance from so many sources because of despair. I'm not directly dealing with that because one has to recognize that as a fallen people in a fallen, sinful, broken world, just as we can have physical and medical ailments, so our mind can experience tremendous difficulties, traumas, and so on. And sometimes, thank God, medication can assist and help. But I want to speak more this morning directly about those periods when we go into depression and we go down as a Christian and we're discouraged and we feel like giving up. It feels as though there's more against us than for us. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Well, it does. And remarkably, it is often the greatest characters who achieved the greatest breakthroughs and were so wonderfully anointed and empowered by God, it was those very people who found themselves in deep despair and discouragement. What I love about the Bible and what I sometimes don't like about modern books is that the Bible tells it as it is. Sometimes books today are inclined to put an emphasis on the great achievements on the good times, on the breakthroughs. Whereas the Bible tells of the failures. And the failures are ones that the individuals in question would have preferred that no one knew about. But the Holy Spirit puts them clearly in Scripture for you and I. To recognize that all the men and women of the Bible were people just like you and me, who were flawed and who had a sinful nature, and who had the same devil and the same illnesses and the same trials and discouragements that every other generation have had. A discouraged Christian finds themselves unable to minister to others. When you're in that despondency, you're really in no place to help others. But rather, you need to be rescued and helped yourself. And that's one of the reasons why I encourage people, and I know that there are Christians who will perhaps listen online, and perhaps since COVID, you don't perhaps go to church, and you don't go to a place of worship. I would strongly encourage you to find a place of worship, to find Christians to meet with. I would have to say in my Christian walk that there were many occasions when I felt very down and discouraged. And very often it was simply the conversation or the prayer or the ministry of another believer that was used by God to pick me up and to get me to stand up again and begin to walk. And if you stay on your own, if you isolate yourself, if you get down, there may be nobody to help you up. We're not built to be on an island. God intended that believers would interact and encourage and minister to one another. One of the primary reasons for the deep discouragement that David talked about when he said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. O oh my God, my soul is cast down in me. 
One of the main reasons why people encounter what David is talking about is failure. Failure in the Christian life. Whenever temptation comes and we fail and sin, whenever internally we recognize that we have grieved the Holy Spirit, and we encounter experiences such as guilt, shame, condemnation, fear. All these things begin to enter into our experience which previously weren't there because we were enjoying peace with God. We were enjoying the fact that our sins are forgiven, that we have been fellowshipping with God and, and sharing our testimony perhaps with others, serving the Lord in some capacity, trying to win others for the Lord, and suddenly in our desire to help others and to walk with God, we find ourselves having failed having sinned. So often the devil in his brilliant uh, schemes utilizes this particular tool more perhaps than any other in the lives of Christians. And very often whenever people have sinned against God as Christians, although they have been taught if they're in a good church or in fellowship with others, that the Bible says when we sin, that if we confess our sin to God, he will forgive us. He is just and he's righteous to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yet I would be guaranteed this morning that the vast majority, if not all, Christians today would tell me, Alan, when I feel the Lord in what I did, in what I looked at, in, in what I said, when I confessed it to God, the Lord showed me that I had grieved him and that I had hurt the Holy Spirit. And I felt it so acutely and I felt the joy and the peace had left me. But Alan, when I confessed it to God, I found myself on many occasions after that, continually telling him about it over and over again. You see, friends, when you confess your sin to God, God will instantly forgive your sin. God does not require a prolonged period of time wherein you have to go to some, through some kind of like purgatory or some kind of emotional trauma until God feels that you have paid for that thing which you've done wrong. No, no, no. God will instantly forgive. He will take away the sin. He will restore the fellowship and the Holy Spirit will grant the peace back. But it is at this very point that Satan and his hordes of demons work in the lives of Christians. It is at this very point that he reminds us very acutely about the guilt of what we have done. He reminds us of the condemnation and the fact that we perhaps are no longer a Christian because of what we have done, that the Holy Spirit has drawn away, that God is so displeased with us that surely if, if anybody else knew about what we had done or what, they wouldn't speak to us. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want us in God's house. And so the devil uh, capitalizes on these feelings. And he says, well, of course, now you have, you have failed the Lord, so you will have to pay for that. You'll have to feel bad for a long time, and, and you just can't come back as you are. God couldn't freely fail. You have to pay for it. And then, of course, not only that, he, he'll say, you know, you, you shouldn't really be at the prayer meeting. How would anybody like you be sitting in the prayer meeting with all those holy people uh, praying? And, and look at you. Look what you did. Look what you did. These, my dear friends, are the wonderful tools that Satan uses. 
And if you do not uh, outwit the devil, if you do not grow in your faith, if you are not strong to understand the wiles of the devil, is what Paul calls them, the wiles of the devil, the schemes, the strategies of the devil, then, my dear friend, he will keep you in discouragement and lead you to despair. I have often found that individuals have come to me with problems. They have maybe had some sin, maybe some sexual sin, maybe some, some issue, or, and they felt so overwhelmed by what they had done. And, and they came and they said, well, I asked God for forgiveness, and you know, I, I know he says he forgives, but I don't feel forgiven. I don't think I'm forgiven. It keeps coming back, Alan, and I keep praying about it, but it just, it just won't go away. And we have to take them to the side and to the Scripture, and we have to explain to them that as a Christian, you have to discern when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and when the devil is speaking to you, for they both have voices and they speak to our thoughts. And you see, friend, whenever the devil is speaking to you, he brings condemnation. Condemnation, that is, no matter how often you confess, no matter how much you bring it to God, and no matter how many tears you may shed over it, the devil will keep the condemnation over you and tell you that you, ha you have done an awful thing. You are not good. You are not, you are not a good person. You are not, you're not fit to be in God's house. And perhaps you're not even, he tells you, you're not even a Christian. And many, many suffer with this. You see, my dear friends, the problem with condemnation is that it, you can never get out of it. There's no escape. Condemnation will always lead to despair, always. And that's why if it leads to despair, you can always tell that this is not from God. If it leads to despair and no way out, it's never from God. The Holy Spirit does not condemn us, but he does convict us. He convicts us. He brings the sin that we have committed to our heart and to our mind because he has been offended. We have lost peace and our fellowship with God has been broken and strained. And so he brings the sin before us because he wishes that we would have God's peace again. He wants us to enjoy God's fellowship, to grow in God. He wants that. And so he convicts us. And he brings the sin to us, but he also brings us to the promises of God. And he reminds us that if we bring the sin to God and confess it, that he will gladly and willingly forgive it and blot it out and restore fellowship with God. And so that leads, my dear friends, to deliverance. Conviction always leads to deliverance. Condemnation always leads to despair. And so you have to understand and recognize as a Christian, this is not God speaking to me. This is the devil speaking to me. The devil uh, works underground. He always has done. That has been uh, the great success of the devil. Uh, and of course, he, where he succeeds today uh, wonderfully in this world is telling people he doesn't exist. And that, of course, is his greatest masterstroke because of the work that he does in the world. This world is devil-infested. This world is full of evil. This world, world is full of wickedness and full of sin. And my dear friend, we deal with a tremendous enemy who is very powerful. However, he is an entity that was created by God, a rogue angel who has gone wrong. And that's all he is. God is God. God is the eternal, always has been, always will be. Satan is a created being. God is the eternal God. And there is no comparing the two of them. One is finite, the other is infinite. You cannot put them on the same page. God is all-powerful. And it is because of that in this dark, evil world that is infested by the devil that even in that darkness that the light and power of Jesus Christ can come into the life of a sinner. And God can make that person clean and cause them by the grace of God to be more than an overcomer of the devil, 
For the Bible says in Revelation 12, they overcame him by the blood of the, of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, can I say that some people are inclined to be more prone to going into despair than others? And sometimes that's down to our temperament. It's just our makeup, the type of people we are. Some people have got what you would call a deeper or perhaps a more somber personality. It's called, it, it, they call it in the secular world, melancholy. Now, there's, they say there's four. I'm not going to go into them. But this simply points out that different people have different kinds of personality. And when you are inclined to what they call the melancholy or the sad, then you're probably more of a disposition toward feeling down. People who are inclined to be down or melancholy are inclined to be deep thinkers. There are drawbacks. I, I can say this from experience because I know that I'm on that, I'm on that uh, scale. I know that I'm drawn toward the melancholy. And I'm glad I have the Lord because I don't know where it would take me to if I didn't have the Lord. But there are benefits, you see, regarding personality. And we meet Christians on the journey, and some Christians are very deep thinkers. And we thank God for deep thinkers. People who think deeply, we find the great Solomon, of course, perhaps one of the deepest thinkers. And you sense the despair when he's when he's writing the book of Ecclesiastes. You see it through the book. He's got away from God. He's living for the world. But you can see in his deep thinking, he's not shallow. He's trying everything the world has to offer. He has tried it all in the early chapters. And then the note right throughout. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. It's all nothing. And he comes to the end and the crescendo of that little book, and this is what he says to all those who have listened to this man who has thought through the meaning of life. And he comes to the end and he said, this is my final analysis, fear God and keep his commandments. He says the only way to truly get through life and to find purpose to life and preparation for the next life is to fear God, that is, to love God, to value God, not to want to grieve God, enjoy God, and he said, live in his presence. That's what he said. That's, that's my assessment. But then you find other Christians, friends, that never seem to be down, or if they are, they maybe don't even know they are. They're kind of the bumbling ones. They're the ones that are, you know, always, everything's wonderful. They're fluffy Christians. I meet them occasionally. Fluffy ones. They have all the language and they know. But friends, when you pull back the fluff, there's nothing there. They're not thinkers. They don't think. So you see, there are advantages, my friends, sometimes in having a disposition to going down as a Christian. Because it helps us to recognize the world that we're in. We're in good company with King Solomon. And every true Christian that has any source or any sense of depth to their spirit, they will know something of the battles that occur in the Christian life. And they will experience discouragement. You see, not only is there temptation and failure that can cause discouragement, but then there are words words. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we have the story of Moses talking to the children of Israel, and I'm just abbreviating it, and he's talking about the children of Israel on their way into the promised land, and he talks about the words that were spoken by the children of Israel, some people to others, and he basically brings out, and I'm just, you can read it at your leisure, but I'm just bringing out in a synopsis, just bringing to you that he rebukes them. He says, because your words have discouraged your brethren. Your words have discouraged your brethren. There is great power in words. The Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. 
Now, there are many today, especially perhaps in America, where they have taken this text, and in my humble opinion, they have blown it out of all proportion. And I have sometimes met Christians, for example, who, who, who won't say, for example, I have a bad leg or uh, my back's bad today, because they say if you speak words, you know, that will have an impact. I don't believe that <clears throat> that's what the Bible teaches at all. Because you find that on many occasions when Paul was writing, he pointed out about uh, he had left uh, individuals who were sick or people who had problems or Timothy told him to take a little bit of uh, uh, wine for his stomach. And so, so one has to remember that you're in the real world and we have to accept that we're in a fallen world. And so, but what I believe is that when we come to the area of words, it is when words are spoken habitually. Now, let me illustrate this, uh, where, and I would speak especially to parents this morning. Uh, when you tell your child that they're no good, if you could see the devastation that you have put into them, you would never say it. Because if you were to lift a crowbar and hit them, well, you would say, I could, that, that, you couldn't do that on a child. Do you remember the little thing they used to say, sticks and stones can break your bones, but names or whatever can never hurt you. No greater lie was ever spoken. That's a lie. Words can do into the lives of people what sticks and stones and guns could never do. Because children look to adults. What you invest and push into them has a huge bearing on their growing and on their adulthood. A child will thrive best in an environment of love. Unconditional love. It's good even especially to fathers this morning. It's good to put your arms around your children, even when they're adults, and your child might be bigger than you, but to put your arms around them and tell them that you love them. Now you say, I, that's not the kind of thing we do. <laughs> Heard that many so on, especially in Ireland. That's not the thing we do. My daddy didn't do that. Yes, and your daddy should have done it. Just because culturally what we have done for generations does not mean that it's right. My dear friends, we were designed by God for love. When Adam was in the garden, he was surrounded by love. He thrived in an environment of love. And when we leave this world, we will go to a country and a city where the very atmosphere will be nothing but love. Because that's the way we're designed. That's how God made us. And God intended that fathers should replicate him on earth. And I, like every other father, if he's been honest, sometimes bemoan the times that I didn't replicate God very good to my children. Because if a father replicates God well to his children, the children will not be afraid of God. I have seen people who have said, I, 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 I couldn't trust God. Why not? I couldn't trust my father. Father didn't replicate God very good. And so if you have failed in this area, don't despair. Start now. Many's a time uh, at the kitchen table, it's not a regular thing, but if I take the notion, I go around my children and they know, I say, I'm going to pray over you now, and they say, oh, all right, okay, if that's what you have to do. And I go around and I speak over them, I pray over them, and I tell them that I love them, I'm glad for the areas where they have succeeded, 
and I have pride in those areas, and I pray for the needs and the areas where they may have failed. I have no perfect children, just by the way, and I'm not making out anything great from this pulpit. I'm just simply pointing out an area that I have observed with many people who have come to my home who have been so deeply broken by words, and it has caused me to reevaluate my own life and my own words. And I have learned that when people are encouraged and when words are spoken in and whenever arms are put around and when words of encouragement are given, my dear friends, you might have a a child that will shrug you off. You might have a child that will laugh at you. But down deep inside that child's heart, there will be a melting. There will be a melting. Something will melt inside. And they will know to the day they die My mom or my dad loved me. And that will meet a need in them, my friends, that may never, ever otherwise be met. I believe it's one of the reasons why there is such dysfunction today in homes and tragically in many Christian homes. And I encourage you, where you feel you've failed, don't go into condemnation. Just ask the Lord to help you, and the Lord will help you. There was a great preacher over in America, I forget his name now, but he came to the the, um, realization of this issue. He had a huge church, mega church, thousands. And he began to do just what I've said. He began to pray as a father, especially with his sons. He began to pray with them. Not not big prayer meetings or anything, not, not driving the children mad just putting his arms around them and saying a prayer and just going on as per normal. And he did it. And then he encouraged the congregation to it. And he said after that, the influx of young men that had been prayed for in that church but never responded, he said there was an influx of young men all responding to this act of love from their fathers that they all began to come to church. Amazing. We always respond the best in love. We don't respond well to legalism. The evangelical church in the the, the evangelical wing, the, the, the legalistic wing, and that is, oh, you, you sit there. I think children should sit, just by the way. I don't like to see them running about. That's just me. But, but you know what I mean where they said, say about the children? You just sit there and don't you speak and you be quiet and, 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 and make sure you look right and make sure you behave right. And it's all about all these rules all on them. And you know, my friends, very often children, they don't like that. They don't like that. Now, I'm still saying things need to be done. Don't get me wrong. But if the children come into an environment where the parents of other children, where the elders, where the deacons, where the leaders, that they come over and they demonstrate love to those children, where it's a loving environment, you know, those children are just begin to open up. So they will. But so often we're, we're on the end of the harsh tongue, aren't we? And we say things. We've all done it. We've all done it. But my friends, words bring immense discouragement. And the Bible says that our tongues in James can be a world of iniquity. A world of iniquity. The Proverbs tells us in Proverbs, let me just read it to you in 25. In Proverbs chapter 25 and the verse 11, we read these words. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Commentators say that this was the King Solomon or one of the kings of Israel or David. And and in his royal palace, he saw this beautiful solid silver platter sitting. And whether it was literally gold, pears or apples or citrus fruit, whatever it was, or whether it was actually they were made like gold. But he said the, the imagery of the beauty 
of the gold reflecting on the silver and the sun. He said this was an image that was, was in the king's mind. And as he was writing scripture, he said the beauty of that and the value of that, he said that's just like words that are spoken. Words that are fitly spoken. And so we must bring our tongue to God's altar. We must lay it down. It's the hardest thing to control. But God, by his sanctifying grace, can do that. An American preacher, I forget his name now, many years ago he preached. And when he made an appeal, he was a holiness preacher. This woman came forward every night. And she was at the altar and she used to cry, Oh God, sanctify me. Come and fill me. And, and, take, and, and, and the preacher, he got so weary. She was out every night bawling and howling at the front. And he really got annoyed with her. And he began to pray and he said, Lord, what is wrong with this woman? She keeps coming out every night and she almost makes a scene. As others are seeking God, she's always there. And the Lord said, It's her tongue. It's her tongue. And so the following night, the preacher stood, and he was quite a quaint character, and uh, she, out she came, and oh, she was bawling and roaring at the front about being sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said to the lady, he said, if I told you what your problem was, would you repent? And she said, of course I would. I long for God to meet me and change me. Well, he says, God has told me that you have a tongue 20 foot long. And he said, the altar's long enough. You should be able to get it out on the altar. You're an old gossip. You're an old gossip. And you know, my dear friends, you can be an evangelical gossip. You can be an evangelical gossip. And you'll say, here's a wee thing to pray about. Not at all. Not a bit of it to pray about. It's just to gossip about and just to talk about. And it's all to do with God, but it's all to do with God's people. And just the tongues on the go all the time. Well, he said to the woman, if you repent, she says, There's, uh, uh, not my tongue. Well, he, t got, he really had his fill of her by then. So he turned around to the congregation and he said, put your hand up if this woman's a gossip. And every one of them put their hand up in the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> and she ran out. Our tongue, our tongue needs to be dealt with. Very quickly, unbelief, unbelief. The children of Israel, when God told them to go to Kadesh Barnea, to enter into the land, they went. And 10 of the 12 spies went into the land and they saw giants. Now, when they came back, they told about giants. Friends, listen, they were giants. They were giants. They were entities uh, bigger than Goliath. Like they weren't, they weren't just exaggerating. They were giants. They said there were walled cities, walled cities that were built by giants. I mean, this was a real genuine obstacle that was before them. And they came back with Joshua and Caleb and they said to the people, listen, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we can get this land. And all the people began to cry. Joshua and Caleb said, listen, we're well able to take the land. The Lord's with us. Don't be looking at the wall. Don't be thinking about the giants. Keep your eye on the Lord. The Lord's bigger than all of it. He can get us in. But they turned the hearts of the people. And the people turned back. And it finished up that whole generation died in the wilderness. They all died in a spirit and in a, 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 a spiritual attitude of unbelief. God never, ever got them out of that. And they died in a low, barren place when God intended them to be in a land that was full of milk and honey. You know, dear friend, when you enter the Christian life, I want to tell you that God has spiritually for you a land of milk and honey. But if you do not pursue and you behave the way the children of Israel behaved, then you could end up in a barren wilderness as a Christian. You would get to heaven, but you'll not be strong. I'm amazed so many people uh, 
who I talk to, and it's one of the privileges of dealing with people. You get to know where people are and where the church is today. I have been amazed at people who have come to me uh, to talk over issues as Christians. And they tell me of the trials and the troubles and the difficulties that they have encountered in their Christian life. And we talk at length to them. And I talk to them about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of these people have been in evangelical churches in Ulster for 40 or 50 years. And they tell me, I have no, I have no idea what you're talking about. My dear friends, there's an awful catastrophe in the pulpits of Ulster where the people of God are not being taught how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, where many men in their pulpits don't even believe that any subsequent experiences to God other than conversion is necessary. As Martin Lloyd-Jones rightly said and fell out with his peers at the time, said, if what we are experiencing in our churches today is the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then why in God's name are we in the state that we're in? And I, I believe Martin Lloyd-Jones was right. You see, my dear friends, many come and they say, I, I don't know about fullness of the Spirit. I don't know about being totally yielded to God. They just know about reading their Bible. They have been told to go to the prayer meeting and pray a little more. Be good. And make sure that you dress appropriately and you fit into the denomination and you're loyal to your denomination and so on and so forth. But no victory in the world, no overcoming the devil, no awareness of the conflict, no desire for sanctification of life toward God or pursuing God in a deeper way. And very often these people are much more loyal to their denomination or to their little group than to Christ. My dear friends, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is he the way to? He's the way to God. And if you're a Christian, the, the focus of your life should not be my loyalty to a denomination or a flag or a tag. My loyalty is to God. My loyalty is to Christ. Because all these denominations and all these flags and tags, my friend, they will either fall off or burn off. Why would I waste my time and life standing up for some denomination or some little group, some wee segment in the midst of the world? I wouldn't waste my breath. I wouldn't waste my time nor breath on it. My dear friends, I believe our whole loyalty should be to the God of heaven. Our whole loyalty should be to the Christ of God who died and rose again. And every Christian should be saying, my loyalty is to him. My talk is him. My obedience is to him. My joy comes from him. My sorrow is brought to him. Everything is him. That's the life of the Christian. Not some little denomination that was manufactured. No, away with it, my friend. Away with it. And give me Christ. Give me the Lord. Give me fellowship with God. Give me the house of prayer. Give me the place where people are meeting and communing with God. Any time, any day, I'll be there. I'll be there. You see, my friends, they were discouraged. And their unbelief as they saw the mountains, they turned back. And sometimes we see the mountains in life. The difficulties in the home. The problems with people. So many things. We see the mountains. And we just give up in despair. Joshua and Caleb rather said, we're well able to take the land. Oh, my friend, no matter what discouragement you have in your life, and you have unique things happening in your life that don't happen in the lives of anyone around you. Oh, yes, they're unique. Yes, they are difficult. But listen, God knows all about them. And if you give them to God and you give yourself to God and ask God to cleanse you and fill you and sanctify you and let him begin to handle you in a deeper way, he will begin to teach you. And it brings me to the point I was beginning to mention a moment ago. As people often come to my house and they say, I'm saved 40 years, I don't know any. And I say to them, you know, this issue that's happening, this is the devil. This thing that's happening in your life at the moment, this is the devil. It is all the tricks of the devil. 
I said, what have you been doing regarding the devil attacking your home? I don't know. You don't know? You're 40 years a Christian. You're in the kingdom of God. You're in a so-called evangelical church, as, as Brother Eric Stewart used to say, with the emphasis on the jelly. And you don't know how to fight the devil? Man, have you not read your Bible? Have you not ever turned to Ephesians chapter 6 when Paul wrote and he said, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places? What was Paul talking about? His own experience as a Christian. In his many years, my friend, he sought God, he went after God, and it wasn't long until he was on the journey with discouragement and many other things that he encountered the devil. But he recognized it was the devil, and so he started to utilize the weapons of God against the devil. He took the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He lifted the shield of faith. He put on the breastplate of righteousness. He got on the feet uh, with the preparation of the gospel, and he put on all the garments and all the panoply of God and all the armor of God. He placed it on him, and he wrestled, and he fought the devil. And my dear friend, one thing I have learned and am learning is that when the devil attacks you as a Christian, if you put on all the armor of God, and if you fight against the devil, the Bible says resist him, and he will flee from you. I have discovered that the name of Jesus Christ is more powerful than every demon in hell combined. I have discovered that that name can destroy the powers of darkness and you can come out more than a conqueror. I have discovered that. My friends, that's not theory. But I meet so many Christians and they say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so in little baby steps, I have to say to them, this is what you must do. When the devil comes into your life, when he comes against your home, when he comes against your children, when he comes to put his dirty claw to get them and draw them into the darkness, my friend, mother and father are Christian. You must begin to put the war armor of God upon you. You have to pray and dedicate your home, your property, everything that you have and are. You give that to God and ask the Holy Spirit to take total Total control of your life and begin to sanctify you and change you and cleanse your home and cleanse your land. You might find that the Holy Ghost will show you things in your life undoubtedly that are not right. Well, deal with it and God will draw closer to you. There may be things in your home that need got rid of. The Holy Spirit will point it out and you get rid of it. He might tell you that there's bills to be paid that haven't been paid. Go and pay them and God will draw near to you. You might find that you've fallen out with a person or you have an issue with a person, the Holy Ghost will come and say, deal with that. My dear friends, Christianity is extremely practical and real, and it does work. Amen. It does work if you apply it. And that's the big if. And my dear friends, whenever unbelief takes hold, then you can be risen and drawn up out of that slough of despond. And out of despair. Very quickly. Our time is running on. Disappointments. Disappointments. Oh, in the Christian life. Disappointments can come. You know, Elijah was used by the Lord in a wonderful way on Mount Carmel. The man had devoted his life. He just appeared like Haley's Comet. In the darkness of Israel, just like Haley's Comet, a, a ray of light came over the country. It was Elijah who had been trained by God in secret, prepared through prayer, through sanctification, through the fullness of the Spirit. This great prophet for Israel was prepared, and suddenly God launched him out against the most godless queen and wicked king in Israel's history. And he faced them down on Mount Carmel, and all their wicked old prophets. And he took the heads off the prophets and he called for fire from heaven and fire came down and the Bible says the fire fell and then, then, the, then the, the rain fell and then the people fell. And he was so excited he took the old prophets down and they cut their heads off and then the devil came. The devil came. In the form of Jezebel. And she said, I'll have your life. I'll have your head, 
But my dear friends, let me tell you that whenever Elijah took to his heels to run for his life and then to pursue and desire suicide, he didn't just, he didn't just encounter the words of a wicked woman. There was a power that was coming behind those words. The power of the demonic power Jezebel. He felt hell let loose on him after his greatest victory in his life. And he ran and he fell exhausted and he said to God, it is enough. I'll die now. I've had enough. You ever there? <laughs> I've had enough. It's too much, Lord. It's too hard. Ever there? Oh, my friend, I have known days in my Christian life, and I tell you the truth, where I have said continually through the day, I haven't prayed, I haven't read, I have just lay down or walked, and I've just cried from in, down deep, deep, deep down in there. Help. Help me. Help me, Lord. And it can be hard. It can be hard. But you know what? He's always helped. He's always helped. And he'll help you too. He'll help you too. Let's come to the end. Disappointments. Elijah, you see, thought that there would be a great revival and that it would all go a certain way. And it didn't happen the way he thought. And that can happen. For those of us in the ministry, that can happen. God had to keep coming to him and get him back on his feet. But let's conclude. Persistent trials. Persistent trials. <laughs> you know, it's bad when you get a trial. <laughs> you go into a wee deep spot and then Lord gets you out of it and gets you up and gets you going again. But sometimes the Lord can put you through persistent trials. Just keeps going. Keeps going. Just like pressure. Just like, just like a, a handbrake on a tire. You just feel that constantly on you. And it's wearisome. And God has given you a promise. God has given you something in your heart. And you know that's from him. Something that, that he has told you is going to happen. And it seems as though, although he told you that, that everything's going the opposite direction. Well, let me tell you, if that's you this morning, you're in good company with Bible characters. Because that's the way God does it. We read of... Joseph, whenever he was called by God as a young teenager, and he was going to be the one whom his brethren and Israel would bow down to, and he was so, so full of excitement. And after that, he ends up in prison. The pit. Everything goes wrong. It all goes the other way. Why? Because, you see, God can plant in your spirit in a moment. And this is what he often does with people who he has an assignment for in their life. God will put something in your spirit in a moment. Your calling, your ministry, the direction of your life, he'll just launch it into you. And when it happens, you'll be so excited. And you'll just be thinking, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm going to do this. But what you have to learn after years of trial is that while God can put in you what he wants to do, he has to shape your personality. He has to shape and prepare you physically, mentally, spiritually to actually perform that. And that's why trials are necessary. He has to shape you to the calling. And that involves what the Bible calls deferred hope. The Bible says deferred hope makes the heart sad. And you can get sad. And I, I would be lost this morning if I was to tell you the number of times I have experienced deferred hope. And I've said, God, why? 
You promised me things, Lord, and you haven't fulfilled them. And Lord, it seems as though everything just goes the other way. Seems. But what happened with Joseph? What happened with King David? What happened with these Bible characters? Well, in God's timing, the day came when God fulfilled what he said he would do. And very often God did it whenever these men felt that they were least prepared, that they couldn't do it. Just like Moses when he wanted to go out and kill the Egyptians when God had called him and put it in his heart to be a deliverer. He went out initially as a 40-year-old man. I'll bury them in the sand, kill them one at a time. And oh, God says, no, you're not ready. And so God takes them to the backside of the wilderness. <clears throat> you couldn't get further lost than that. And he gets them there and God then does the stripping. God does the working. God does the preparing. And then God comes at the burning bush. Forty years later, unexpectedly, God turns up and he said, you're ready now. And he said, send someone else. Different man. Different man. He has been shaped by God. Shaped by God. Well, friends, as we conclude... What's the answer to the depression on this? What is the answer, very briefly? Well, it's in the text. First of all, we begin to recognize where we are and we talk to ourselves. A man said on one occasion, I often talk to myself for there's nobody else sensible to talk to. And sometimes that's true. Talk to yourself. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? I talk to myself at times. When I go to pray and a lot of things come up, and I say, now, come on, settle yourself. Come on. No, you're not, you're not going out. You're not going outside. You're going to pray. I talk to myself because I have a flesh. I have a nature that want, doesn't want God. And I tell it, you're going to obey. You're not going to rule me. You're not going to rule me. I, I, I want this life ruled by God. And so you're going to obey, and I'm going to, I'm going to deal with you. You will fall into line as the blood of Christ, as the Holy Spirit deals with you, and I will that God deals with you. you. You will come into alignment with God's will. And he talks to himself, and he says, Why art thou cast down? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Ah, my friend, the antidote to it all. The antidote to all discouragement. Hope thou in God. Pilgrim shouted out, help, help. <laughs> These two big hands came and got him out of slough of despond, pulled him out. <laughs> Every time you call for help, I'll be here. I'll be here. Pulling out of slough of despond. Hope thou in God. Think about God. Think about the promises of God. Think about the faithfulness of God in the past. Think about the answers. Oh, my friend, the number of times that I have had to return to, to the past when I'm in the present. And I have had to be reminded by myself and go back to, to visitations when God came to me, when God delivered me, when God, and I have gone back and I have taken that fact and I have brought it to the present and I have said, Lord, you delivered me then and you'll deliver me now. You'll help me now, Lord, because this brick wall's in front of me and this opposition's here, but Lord, you helped me there. And you helped me there, Lord. And you come through for me there, Lord. And Lord, you'll come through for me now. I can't see how it'll come. I have no idea. But I'm trusting you, Lord. And I'm not looking at the wall anymore. And I'm not looking at the opposition anymore. And I'm not looking at the problems anymore. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm lifting my eye off them. Lord, I'm lifting them way up to you, the great deliverer. And Lord, I'm just trusting that you'll help me through here. Hope thou in God. And then he says, for I will yet praise him. He says, I'm in a low place and I can't praise God at the moment. But he says, I will praise him. And my friend, when you do those things, God will lift you out of discouragement. 
and you'll begin to praise him again. And he'll help you on that wonderful journey that leads to the celestial city. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word and your truth. We pray, Lord, that you will bless the lives of many, many people. And Lord, that they'll be built up in their most holy faith, from the youngest convert to the oldest saint, that, Lord, you would teach us in this this journey that we're on toward heaven and home, that we'd we'd be at our best, Lord, that we'd give all to you, that we'd be taught of your Spirit, and that we would know you in an intimate and a deep way. So we pray, Lord, your blessing now on the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen.